honored guests, friends, and my fellow Oklahomans. It is with deep gratitude and thanks to my Heavenly Father and with determination in my heart that I stand before you today. Today marks one year since Jinx businessman Kevin Stitt put his hand on a Bible and swore to serve the people of Oklahoma as governor. And this morning, Governor Stitt is with us in the KRMG studios. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you guys. Welcome back to the KRMG Morning News. Before we get to any of the, the state stuff, let's do first things first. How are Sarah and the kids getting acclimated to all this extra attention and the new digs and everything? How's that going? You know, it's going great. We, we miss Tulsa. We miss our friends, uh, our school. The kids were, uh, the you know, until we got to Thanksgiving, I told them, just get to Thanksgiving and it'll be better. But now they're, uh, they're, they're all in. They've got a whole new set of friends. But, uh, but we miss Tulsa. It's obviously harder for the older kids. My junior in high school, he misses all of his friends. But uh, it's, been, it's been great. Sarah's never lived outside of Tulsa her whole oh, life. Wow. And uh, so it's been, uh, it's been, it's been good. And, and Oklahoma City's fantastic, but uh, Tulsa's uh, Tulsa's still home. We have a, a very tight window with you here, so some of these questions are going to be short and to the point. We have several open mics that we want to fit into, so here we go. Let's do the numbers first. You have built your administration around the vision of being a top ten state in every applicable category, whether it's economic opportunity, education, public safety, what have you. Uh, give us some metrics to show that you're making progress. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing that I'm super proud of, we'd never done it before, but uh, uh, we saved $200 million last year. Uh, that is significant. Now we have over a billion dollars. We're looking very prophetic because this year's budget looks like it's going to be a flat budget. What's important for Oklahoma is to understand, had we spent every dime we had last year and increased all the base level of expenses to all the state agencies, we possibly could be cutting this year. That's how important it was to control the growth of state government. And so I thought that was important to replenish our savings account so we don't have to cut core services. And then I'm super excited. I mean, online checkbook, it was something I talked about on the right, campaign trail, that. bringing some uh, transparency to state government. We were ranked 47th when I got there. We're now, the rankings came out, we're now the uh, seventh most transparent uh, state government. So uh, excited about that. <laughs> but Ty, there's a category where you instantly went into the top 10. That's uh, amazing. Absolutely. Uh, roads and bridges. This is something I'm super proud of. Uh, we're now ranked 13th in bridge conditions. We've got a plan to get top 10. And I said, what about pavement conditions? We're currently 28th. Uh, but with this vision to be top 10, it gives my state agency something to rally around and exactly the vision and what they're striving for. Because I don't believe we, we take second place to any other state. That's why I encourage us. We can be top 10. Uh, but I could go on. Largest commutation in U.S. history. Uh, these low-level drug offenders, uh, simple possessions, I was able to make it happen on November 1st. And, uh, and so that's a huge top 10 thing. Now now we're not number one in incarceration anymore. Uh, we're, we're number two, and, we've, and we're continuing to move the needle there and give certain people second chances. All right. We'll get into more in criminal justice reform in, in just a moment, but I know Rick's got a question. Yeah, I know that you, you, know, you mentioned agencies. Having, being able to point your own agencies was a huge deal with you. You told us that morning was one of the things you were going to do. Can you give us some indications of how that's really helped you move things forward? Yeah, well, I mean, I just said about that, uh, the largest commutation in, uh, in, in U.S. history, uh, these low-level drug offenders, that would not have been possible had I not been able to uh, replace the person running corrections and the person running pardon and parole. So now they're working together for the first time ever, and they made that happen. Because, folks, we you can pass all the laws you want in the legislature, but still you have to execute, roll up your sleeves, and then it becomes a business to actually make those things happen. Uh, encourage the employees. We worked all weekend long making that thing happen, and that was just a vision that I set, getting mm -hmm. the right people in place. But thanks to the legislature, my friends and the House and the Senate, they gave me that authority, and the, we're showing uh, we're showing the uh, effects of that. But uh, obviously, the roads and bridges is another one that I can appoint and get that person there. Uh, DHS is something we're moving the needle on tremendously. Uh, Justin Brown is a guy that we appointed to that position. So you've appointed or replaced three of the five agency positions, right, that you, the agency heads that you can replace. Is that correct? Is that the right number? Actually, there's been, uh, we've actually put 18 new uh, agency positions in place. 
No 18 kidding. New, yeah, 18 new uh, new agency heads, and uh, we've we've appointed about 250 new people to different boards or commissions. And I'm really bringing outside uh, folks that have never been in state government. Uh, these are big, big CEO roles in a lot of cases. Like DHS has 6,500 employees. Mm-hmm. It's not a small agency. Uh, my healthcare authority. Uh, This is something Oklahomans need to understand. We were the only state that didn't give the governor the authority to run health care. That is $6 billion. It's the largest spend in our state agency. And now we we have a guy named Kevin Corbett running that. Uh, He's fantastic. And and later this month, I'm rolling out my health care plan that I'm really excited to share with Oklahomans about. And and that's another topic. (laughs) It's it's on the list here, but let's work our way there. You've been very public in stating that you also want to have uh, authority to appoint the state school superintendent. That job is currently an elected uh, position. A, a couple of questions related to that. Why shouldn't voters be trusted to choose the state school superintendent? And aren't conservative Republicans, isn't the core, a core value for conservative Republicans to fight against centralized control of government and especially the schools? Well, I just look, if we want to be a top 10 state, I'm just sharing with Oklahomans what other states are doing and other state governors. I think there's only 12 states that uh, separately elect their state superintendent of schools. Uh, If we were number one in education in the country right now, I would say everything was working fine. And I have a great relationship with Joy Hoffmeister, but you've got to get everybody lined up with the same vision and 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 you've got to get... uh, uh, everybody's singing from the same hymnal, basically, and everybody around the same vision. And so that's why I think that it needs to flow up through the governor. So everywhere I went on the campaign trail, people want me to address education, higher ed, and career techs. Yeah. But what I remind Oklahomans, I have zero authority for those three those three uh, 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 agencies, basically. And so I'm telling Oklahomans that that if we want to, if you want the governor to move the needle, um, we we've got to be able to appoint and and be able to have influence over that. I've done. I, I was super proud. We're now number one in the region in teacher pay. We did a teacher pay raise for the second year in a row. That was super important. We've got some great reforms coming. Uh, but that, that listen. That's why I. Think Think, that's why I think that we ought to be more aligned with uh, with the governor on these different state agencies. Consolidating all that power, and you are the most powerful governor now in the history of Oklahoma because of the changes that you've made. Eventually, there's going to be a liberal Democrat in that office. You okay with them having that power too? You know, absolutely. There's, there's obviously ditches on either side. And, and so when I've talked to, I believe that uh, Governor Henry and Governor Walters and uh, Governor Fallon, all the governors that came before me, they, they want the best for Oklahoma. And so, uh, but, but ultimately, if the governor makes a bad decision and we take the, and, and we do bad things, then we're accountable to the 4 million Oklahomans. And that's why I think that's a better strategy uh, than, than having different boards or commissions that are unaccountable, that the public doesn't know who who's accountable to uh, the higher regents for higher education for career techs that's why i just think it needs to be um it, it just has to be more controlled and, and 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 more structured i think like you're electing the governor or the ceo of the state and uh, and that's why i've been pushing for these and i think everybody can see us making those right decisions the buck stops at your desk whether it's occupied by you or somebody else that's that's the way i feel about it All right. governor kevin stitz in the uh, studios with us for his one year anniversary in office 719. Yes, I don't remember this dispute with the tribes being part of the governor's campaign. I will not vote for him again based on this issue alone. I don't care what else he's done. Governor Kevin Stitt in the studio on the KRMG Morning News with Dan Potter for another half hour, 25 minutes or so to talk about his first year in office. She brings up a good point. I didn't hear about this in the campaign. So why this fight with the tribes right now over the gaming compact? Well, first off, uh, I don't think it is a fight with the tribes. I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation. I was elected to look at all contracts and to not play favorites with anybody. And so uh, when I first got to the got to the office, there were letters back to 2016, 2017 to the form administration saying these compacts expire. They wanted Governor Fallon to start renegotiating because they didn't currently um, – uh, reflect current market with things that the, tr- that the casinos needed. Uh, but we really believe that these expire on January 1st, 2020. I don't think any contract goes on forever. And to me, it's just a simple question. What is it worth for the state to give a license to operate casinos? Okay, we don't live in a vacuum. New Mexico has casinos, Arizona, 
Florida, Connecticut. That is worth something. And so we have to do that. And now it's in the courts. Uh, I reached out to uh, all the different tribes. I went and visited them. I didn't want this to be a, uh, a big issue. They have refused to talk to the governor. They've refused to negotiate so you're a saying new compact. You have letters saying that they weren't happy with the compact and wanted to renegotiate it, that letters addressed to Governor Fallon, but now that you're in office, they don't want to? A hundred percent. I have letters that say, as you know, the compacts expire on January 1st, 2020. 20, we need to sit down and renegotiate the terms. But now, once you were sworn in, they well, reversed themselves? Absolutely. They've got the sweetest deal in the country. They don't want anything to change. And I don't I don't begrudge them. Uh, but it's a legal issue at this point. So did they think they could get a better deal with Mary Fallon than with you? Is that- I, 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 I don't know. But the point the huh. point is that they, they knew that they expired. They sent letters to the previous administration. Now they're all talking and saying, hey, no, 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 these go on forever. They auto renew. No contract goes on forever. And the, the state, contract does say both parties have to want to renegotiate, doesn't it? It says a very clean language. This compact expires on January 1st, 2020. And then there's some mumbo jumbo legal terms that says if certain, certain things were done, they, they renew for another 15 years. Our, the state's opinion is they have not done those things. So now it's in court. So the Cherokees, Choctaws and the Chick and the Chickasaws have sued uh, the state to say these things go on forever. And so that's great. Let's just go let the courts decide. I will always fight for a fair deal for all 4 million Oklahomans. I'm not going to roll over and, and, and renew a bad contract for Oklahoma. My job as governor is to think about what's best for our state for the next 15 years, for the next 30 years, for the next 50 years, and I'll keep maintaining. We need to get a fair deal for them, for the casino industry, but also uh, for the state of Oklahoma, the citizens, 88% of the revenue goes to uh, education. And if you if you look at the numbers, uh, the amount that we get for the amount of gaming revenue in our state is not a market deal. We're getting a lot of open mics and people asking questions about immigrants and asking for immigrants in Oklahoma. Can you explain your position? Yeah, absolutely. So the Trump administration um, has redone the vetting process. They've gone from 110,000 immigrants, uh, refugees, down to 8,000. They basically ask all the governors, which I appreciate the state's rights, to say, hey, you have to opt in to whether you're going to accept this. And the Trump administration said, we would like you guys to continue to accept it. Oklahoma only receives about 200 immigrants a year. They're mostly from the Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast part of uh, uh, the world. World, uh, some islands that they're pers- some some Christians that have been persecuted. Um, about 200 that we receive. The the churches, the Catholic charities asked me to do that. President Trump asked me to do that, and so I was happy to do that. We're we're it's a great vetting process. Uh, I made sure that we're uh, uh, we're limiting the amount of people that uh, that we bring in, but it's going to be about 200, and I'm monitoring that very very closely. There are still uh, roughly a half a million Oklahomans without health insurance. And one of your campaign promises was to establish a state-sponsored health insurance program. Hasn't happened yet. Is that one of your priorities for 2020? Absolutely. Uh, I've been up to Washington, D.C. several times, been working with the uh, administration and uh, Seema Verma, who's over kind of the the federal program for uh, Medicaid and health insurance. Uh, State question 802 is going to be on the ballot at some point, and I'll be deciding what election to put that on here in the the not-so-distant future. Um, That is the wrong approach for Oklahoma. Basically, 802, the state question 802, puts that into our Constitution. We already have one of the largest constitutions uh, in the country. It gives us zero flexibility if anything changes from the federal level. So I'm going to be telling Oklahomans that's the wrong approach uh, to expand Medicaid. Uh, I hear you, though. Oklahomans want better outcomes in health care. And so I'm going to I'm looking at a conservative way where we can bring some of those federal dollars into our state that we can require some premiums uh, for people to pay, just like I pay uh, co-pays or premiums on my health insurance and you pay on your health insurance. I think it's only fair that when we design this program that we have some premiums uh, for, um, you know, people under the 138% of poverty line is basically how it works. Uh, but we are bringing that, those dollars in. I will have the whole plan rolled out by the 30th of this month. Oh. Really excited about that to share with Oklahomans um, and maybe even doing a press conference uh, with uh, – 
uh, with the Trump administration. We're really working closely with coming up with a conservative way to do this versus 802. We, we've got to defeat that because uh, if that passes, then we have no option. There's no way to pay for it. It's going to cost about $150 million. Uh, on my plan that I'm going to be rolling, I'm going to show Oklahomans how we can pay for uh, this expanded of federal dollars. Do you have a price tag on yours yet or an estimate? Yeah, it, you know, it'll be um, not exactly, but I think we can get some providers to pay for it. And uh, and, and that's what I'm going to be rolling out, uh, you know, towards the end of this month. I saw you had an interview with Tulsa World and you said you gave yourself an A uh, in year number <laughs> one. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you at all. I'm just going to ask, what would you do to bump that to an A+. Plus? You know, uh, I just don't think I've made the change that uh, that I wanted to in the state agency. So it's so hard to make change in the state agencies. I believe that the the, the state government uh, has some waste and some fat in different areas. I'm working on that. I mean, I, I've dug into the 5,000 plus vehicles that we have in our state, and I've ranked them by, uh, you know, miles driven. There's cars that we own in the state that have been driven zero miles. So I've got a plan to get rid of those and consolidate and get people to share resources. And so I just, those are the things that I'm frustrated with myself that I haven't been able to move the needle fast enough, but uh, we've got a great team in place and uh, it does take longer than the private sector to move the needle in, in state government. But I just want Oklahomans to know I'm so happy to be their governor and and uh, I roll up my sleeves every day, dig into the weeds, dig into the details uh, to move the needle for our state. Because we can be, we will be a top 10 state. Well, speaking of vehicles. My question for the governor would be, what is his thoughts on the turnpike? And what is his outlook in the future? I bet you get that question once a week at least. Uh, what about the turnpike? We're going to see the end of tolls on the turnpike. You know, uh, so my thoughts on the Turnpike, I've got Secretary Gatz that's over both Turnpike and Department of Transportation. And so my goal is to consolidate those two agencies uh, because really to us, to, to the to the people of Oklahoma, it's all transportation, right? I don't like silos. I don't like just doing what's good for Turnpike or just doing what's good for uh, transportation because it's all infrastructure in our state. And uh, and so that's, that's, my, that's my goal is to consolidate those two, make the Turnpike Turnpikes uh, contribute money to Department of Transportation for other roads. And really, if we're building turnpikes, and there's certain cases where we're going to have to continue uh, as we're making loops around Tulsa, loops around Oklahoma City, uh, there is a need for it. But we want to we want to do it uh, where it makes sense, and we want to take those dollars and invest them into other rural parts of the state and other infrastructure needs. So I think the first step is to get uh, the leadership all together. Um, they currently have about a billion dollars in bonding, and I'm really watching uh, their 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 over you know. Uh, development of other turnpikes. 735, Dan Potter, Rick Corey with Governor Kevin Stitt. One year in office for the governor. We invite your questions via open mic on the KRMG app. Governor Stitt, please take a look at the workers' comp court. Big business is allowed to just drag it out forever, and the injured worker gets nothing. Mary Fallon created a horrible fiasco with this. Do we need workers' comp reform? That was an issue I hadn't heard about before. You know, that's something that uh, I don't hear a lot about that. Uh, the workers' comp uh, was put into place in the last administration. It's something that we're looking at, and I'm putting the right people in place uh, to oversee that. Obviously, you have to be balanced, and you got to look at what other states do. And we don't want to. We don't want the pendulum to swing too far either way. We've got to be balanced. We got to be balanced with uh, industry to make sure that they don't uh, have unemployment insurance, uh, workers' comp insurance. Uh, out of market with other states, and it puts us in a bad situation for employers to be employed here. But in the same sense, uh, we've got to be balanced and make sure that nobody takes advantage of our wonderful workers in our state. And that's something that I'm very cautious of to make sure that I'm, I use a balanced approach and I look at what market is in other states. More of your questions for Governor Stitt in just a moment. We're going to double back to the uh, the tribes and the issue of the gaming compact because we're hearing a lot of people say, love you, Governor, except for this. So we'll get to that in just a moment. 736. Five. I have heavily supported Kevin Stitt. But due to this issue alone, I will not vote for him again. The governor's right. The compacts do expire. And the Native Americans have not done everything that they said they were going to do. The only people that are concerned about this are the ones that are hooked up on the gambling. Hmm. Uh, governor, you... 
we're getting a lot of open mics from people who seem kind of single issue in regards to uh, your ongoing, well, let's not call it a dispute. I don't know what we call it. Uh, loggerheads with, with the tribes over this gaming compact. Um, do you feel sometimes like maybe you grabbed a tiger by the tail here? Well, <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think there's uh, there's a lot of people that would have uh, uh, taken this stance uh, because if, if you're a politician and you're worried about your, your career, uh, you're not going to uh, tackle, uh, you know, th 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 this, this industry because it's huge. It's very powerful. You can see the ads they're running on TV promoting their industry. And um, but here's the deal. I was elected. I have a fiduciary responsibility to all four million Oklahomans to negotiate the best deal, especially when a compact expires. And, 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 and what is gaming worth? And again, I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation, very proud of our Native American heritage in Oklahoma. But if this is, if this is really a, uh, uh, if the state license this activity, we should ask the question, what is that activity worth, right? Why, why do we want to give away an asset of the state uh, for the next 50 years or 100 years that's not market? And why pulling a slot machine is worth uh, X amount in con uh, Connecticut or Florida or New Mexico, and it's worth a quarter of that in Oklahoma. I just don't believe that. And it's my job to think about that and to ask that question and to say, you know what, I'm going to protect the interest of Oklahoma, the interest of education for the next 50 years. And if I don't do it, I don't know who will. I, I got to think that you guys looked at this and put a number to what that could be worth at the end of it. Did you? And what is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's all part of the negotiations. And I think that the the casinos, they want uh, expanded uh, activity. They want things that would keep them up to market with other states that are that are uh, coming around them. So that's what's been so frustrating is they've refused to negotiate or to talk about that industry and what the rates are. But yeah, it's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that, that our state is getting shorted uh, from a current compact uh, with what other states are getting for the right to operate casinos, right? Uh, I mean, the commercial side. They've called me and said, hey, I'll be there tomorrow and sign an 18% deal with you. Uh, the Oklahomans don't know if, if the Hard Rock Casino is operated by XYZ or it's operated by this company or that company or uh, or this tribe. It's just, it's a casino. And it, it's, uh, it's uh, they're advertising to people in Arkansas, to people in uh, uh, Kansas, to people in Texas. Um, it, and so, so our state should get what it's worth to operate that casino. Here's what's, how so disingenuous it is. Uh, the Cherokee Nation that's operating, uh, my, which is my nation, is operating operating the, the Hard Rock in, uh, just outside of Tulsa, they also went and are operating a casino in Arkansas, just right across the border. They're paying the state of Arkansas between 13 to 20% for every kind of game. In our state, they're paying between 4 to 6% only on half of the games. So, so how is that fair for Oklahoma? And so the people that say, oh, just uh, why are you picking on the tribes or why are you doing this? Uh, just let them auto renew. Wh why would we do that if my job as governor is to think about what's best for Oklahoma for the next 50 years? So uh, I want them to be successful, but I want a fair deal for Oklahoma. You've given them, I believe, seven months, um, an extension, even though the tribes say they don't need it. But you've, you've granted an extension, of, I believe, until August. Is that correct? Yeah, we did an eight-month extension. I've eight had months. several tribes sign on to it. Uh, the big tribes, instead of, instead of signing on to that so we can continue the negotiations, they decided to sue me uh, in federal court. Right. Uh, so that's great. Let's just go find out what the courts say. That's great. Uh, if, if these things auto renew forever, uh, then we know that 15 years ago we got saddled with a bad deal that apparently the state has no rights to say how we operate casinos in our state. But it's, which not, I don't, I, it's not retroactive, though, is it? It's, it would be going forward from that, that point in the contract? What, what are you talking about? It wouldn't be retroactive to the time you think that we were shorted, right? Oh, it yeah. would just be going forward. Just yeah. be going forward, yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I, we could get bogged down in this yes. one issue. We could make this a one issue show, but we, we've got other stuff we want to touch on and lots of open mics. Governor Stitt, when are you planning on or what is your plans of bringing more large corporations to Oklahoma to further our jobs? Economic development. What do you got planned in 2020? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, I'm really excited about uh, is I'll be issuing an executive order. I've already talked to all the state agencies. We've got to go through our regulations, and we've got to limit 
uh, our regulations. President Trump signed an executive order that every new regulations, they would have to get rid of two. I'm going to do the similar type of executive order here in the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, my goal is to reduce regulations by 25% over the next three years. Why is this important? This will unleash uh, growth and economic development in our state. Our state currently has twice as many regulations in the state of Kansas. We've got 15 to 22 percent more than Arkansas and New Mexico, uh, excuse me, Missouri and New Mexico. So we have got to start doing that. I've got commerce focused on five specific states. California is one of them that are overregulated, that are pushing business out. And we've got them targeting those states where we have a competitive advantage, especially with the clusters. And I tell them to design it around the clusters that we already have here. Uh, uh, aviation to defense is a huge one that we're going after all over the country. And we're getting some great wins. Our GDP, uh, the first two quarters of 2019, was in the top 10 in the nation. So I'm excited about what we're doing. we got a lot more to go. I've been on the phone with American Airlines. They've got some great announcements going. I talked to GT Bynum just yesterday, uh, helping them to continue to bring jobs here into Tulsa. I know you've got to go, but uh, before you do, what is your number one priority in 2020? So the number one priority is, uh, is to continue – uh, the agency accountability, continue to manage state government. So we've got some reforms coming, uh, allowing our, our agency heads to continue to operate and run their, their agencies better. I think most governors spend so much time on the policy, they forget about actually running the state government. We spend over $19 billion in federal and state dollars. I want to make sure that all of our tax dollars are spent on mission, on target, moving us to top 10 in whatever we're doing. Uh, so that's my number one target. Uh, obviously, education, infrastructure, and health care are always at the top of our priorities, and it's, it's what kind of consumes my office. And those four things, whether you're Republican, Democrat, you live in rural Oklahoma, urban Oklahoma, we all want the, the best things. We want the best economy, the growing jobs. Uh, we want the best access to health care. We want the best education for our children. We want the best infrastructure, roads and bridges. Yeah. I can boil state government down to those four things and then making sure I look at what other states are doing to kind of continue to move the needle. Well, once we get that done, though, when are we going diving? <laughs> Anytime you tell me, we're re I'm ready to go. Kevin Stitt, thank you so much for spending so much time with us on your first anniversary in office. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks, Oklahoma, for your trust in me. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt. It is 749 five-day forecast brought to you by.